This is the UFD 900 ultrasonic flaw detector that we will be using throughout the course. The microprocessor based instrument consists of the keyboard and the rotary knob which are used to make all the necessary settings for the different applications for the inspection tasks. And it consists of the multicolor screen which displays the ultrasonic waves, ultrasonic signals, and uh, together with the respective readings and important parameter settings on the top. An ultrasonic probe, also called transducer, is connected to the instrument through that cable. So this is the transducer. In our example, we have connected the so-called straight beam probe, which transmits an ultrasonic wave perpendicular into a test piece. Such a probe acts almost simultaneously as a transmitter and receiver. Let me explain and demonstrate practically how ultrasonic testing works in principle. One of the simple uses of ultrasonic testing is to identify a material. So let's say we have a component, this one. We have a component of unknown material and we want to find out what material it is. The transmitter, also called pulser inside the instrument, receives a command from the instrument's microprocessor and sends electrical pulses through that cable, down the cable to the probe. These pulses are sent with a specific repetition rate, uh, so-called pulse repetition frequency, in short PRF. For now, we just take a look at only one transmitted pulse. As soon as the electrical pulse arrives at the piezoelectric element in the probe, the piezo element begins to vibrate. This means the electrical pulse is converted into mechanical energy, in, into vibration in the piezo element. When we place the probe on the test piece, we initially see no signal on the screen. This is because the oscillation, the vibration generated in the ultrasonic probe oscillates at a very high frequency. We use a 5 MHz probe. You see it's a U5P10 and the 5 stands for 5 MHz. Such high frequency vibrations cannot propagate through the air into the material of the test piece as sound waves. Here we need a so-called coupling medium, a coupland, a so-called coupland, to acoustically connect the probe to the test piece. In this example, I'm using an ultrasonic gel, a high viscosity water-based coupland. Put a drop here. If we now acoustically connect the probe to the test piece, we can see a signal on the screen. An ultrasonic wave is now transferred into the test piece through the coupling. This ultrasonic wave propagates perpendicular in the test piece, perpendicular into the test piece, until the ultrasonic wave reaches the back wall of the test piece. The back wall is a boundary between material and air. It is important to understand that there is a tiny layer of air underneath the test piece. Even if the specimen is placed on another solid material, like this one, 
This tiny layer of air is enough to form a barrier to the ultrasound. This means that 100% of the sound beam or the sound wave is reflected at the rear wall. The sound wave thus propagates again in the test body in the direction to the probe. Let's look back at the electrical pulse that hits the piezo element inside the probe. As previously explained, the piezo element in the probe is connected to a damping body. The damping body ensures that the vibration is dampened and the vibration quickly decreases in intensity. After a short time, the vibration comes to an end. You can see the result on the instrument screen. I lift up the probe and what you see on the left side of the A scan, the so called A scan, on the left side you see a signal and that signal is the transmitting pulse, also called the initial pulse. Now as the piezo element is in a resting state, it is ready to act as a receiver. It is waiting, so to speak, for an ultrasonic signal from the material, which in turn causes the piezo element to vibrate. When the emitted ultrasonic wave propagates in the material, then reflected on the back wall, the ultrasonic wave reaches the surface of the test piece. It goes down, comes back, reaches the surface of the test piece. Here again, there is an interface. Unlike the back wall of the specimen, this boundary is a material coupling boundary and not a material air boundary. This means that part of the energy of the ultrasonic wave is transferred into the coupling and then further from the coupling into the probe where, it, where the wave finally reaches the piezoelectric element. Since the piezo element is already in an idle state, the piezo element begins to oscillate again when the sound wave hits it. What is happening here is a conversion of the mechanical energy by the wave into an electrical pulse. This electrical pulse travels from the probe through that cable back to the instrument, to the instrument's receiver where it is amplified and displayed on uh, the screen at a specific position. This uh, received signal is often referred to as an echo. And you see the first large signal here. This is the first back wall echo. The ultrasonic wave propagates in different materials with a certain speed of sound. This is the so-called sound velocity, which is a material constant. There are tables listing the equivalent sound velocities for almost all materials. So if we have measured the sound velocity of the material to be tested, we can easily determine which material it is from the sound velocity table. Let's look back again at the interface at the material surface asset only a certain part of the sound wave energy enters the probe. Another part of the sound wave energy is reflected back from the surface into the material. This means this part of the sound wave propagates again vertically in the material, gets reflected on the back wall, and comes back to the probe. If this wave hits the surface again, 
the previously described happens. A portion of this ultrasonic wave is transmitted into the probe, causing a second signal to be on the screen. And you see here the second signal. This process is repeated several times. Each time the sound wave passes through the test, the test specimen again, it loses some energy, which is visible on the screen as the amplitude decreases. You see a couple of echoes here, and every time it went through, the sound wave went through, it loses some energy, so the amplitude gets lower and lower. The sound velocity in solid material is relatively high. For an example, for steel, the value is around 5920 meter per second. That means with a rather small thickness of um, 30 millimeters of the test object, and you can see we have here a thickness of 30 millimeters. Let me try to do that here, 30 millimeters. As we have in our example here, we would theoretically see a lot of echoes, a long sequence of echoes on the screen. However, due to the loss of energy, when the sound wave passes through the material several times, all energy is lost after some time. The whole process of sending a pulse and receiving echoes takes time. What we have considered here is just one transmitted pulse and the sequence of many backfall echoes from the material. The next transmission pulse is only transmitted from the device to the probe after long enough waiting time has been observed so that many backfall echoes can be displayed on the screen. The entire process described is very quick. For the human eye, the, repre uh, the representations on the screen therefore appear as a stationary picture. It looks stationary here, no change at all. For the human eye, it's not visible. Let's get back to our practical demonstration. The instrument was initially set to 5920 meter per second. This is the sound velocity of steel. The sample thickness was mechanically measured um, at 30 millimeters. But the reported reading we have right now is 28.12. What we need to do now is change the sound velocity value settings so that we measure the correct thickness of 30 millimeters. And that's what I'm doing now. We have the sound velocity function already selected. I enter that, um, um, that function and now I will change the velocity, the velocity settings until we reach 30 millimeters as a measurement value. Oops, that was too much. That's quite close. I can change the resolution a bit more or the settings to smaller values. And now, as you see, I measure 30 millimeters. 30 millimeters and what I need to do is I just uh, confirm now the settings and I can read the sound velocity with uh, 6,000 6, uh, meter per second. So 
So the speed of sound is now uh, set correctly. And when we look into the table for the sound velocities of the material, we will find that this material we have tested here is an alloy of aluminium.